Okay, so last time on why educational games should be awesome, we talked about self-determination theory, the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and how to foster intrinsic motivation. And I left off with the question, let's say I want to create interest in as many people as possible. How do you do that? How do big games do that? Now, the direct answer is to take what you want people to do, what you want them to be interested in, and connect it to something they already have intrinsic interest in, something everyone already wants to do. And that means going big. Like, real big. Things like, everyone wants to feel like they know what they're doing. Like, they're competent. Everyone wants to feel like they have some control over their life. Like, they have some sense of autonomy. And everyone wants to feel like their actions actually matter. And one way for them to feel that is to feel like their actions have an impact on others. Like, there's some sense of relatedness. So that's one way to answer that question, and that brings us to a theory called PENS. No, not those kind of PENS. It stands for player experience of need satisfaction. As in, people need to feel competent and they're motivated to do things that satisfy that need. Now as you may have guessed from the word player, while self-determination theory is more general, Penns is specifically concerned with motivation in video games, and actually grew out of applying self-determination theory to games. Penns is looking specifically at why games are motivating and, what I find really cool, how the mechanics of a game impact motivation. It's looking at how to design a game to foster intrinsic motivation to play it. How to make games you actually want to play. And that's where those three needs come in. When you ask most people why they play a game, they'll say something like, it's really fun. And to make it more motivating, you need to make it more fun, which is not very useful. So they identified these three needs as components of what players enjoy about games. Now what's really cool is they then looked at if you measure these three components, they found them to be a better predictor of if someone is still playing a game and if they would recommend it to others than how fun they rated it. Okay, but even if these are a better predictor, how do you design to foster them? Well, let's go down the list. Players feel competent not just when they succeed at things, but when they succeed at appropriate challenges. As any good tabletop GM knows, what most players actually want is situations where you feel like you could fail, but you'll usually succeed. Most players. So part of satisfying the need for competence is providing challenges that aren't so hard they're frustrating, but aren't so easy that they're boring. And suddenly this sounds real familiar to anyone who's familiar with flow. And it's important to note that while that good feeling is part of this, fostering different feelings of competence means you're concerned about things like the engagement curve in addition to the flow state. You want to mix areas where you're at the very edge of your ability and you just barely beat it and you feel really skilled and like you know what you're doing because you did beat it with areas that you can easily succeed in where you get to relax, especially if they used to be hard. And this is particularly true in RPGs, right? Like where you go back to an earlier zone and you swat this guy who used to be like really hard and threatening and you get a sense of how far you've come since then. And it gives you a sense of how much you've learned, how much you've mastered the game. Fostering competence is about making the player feel knowledgeable and capable, like they can solve problems and overcome challenges. Okay, so moving on to autonomy. Players feel autonomous, like they have control, like they have a sense of agency when they get to make choices. And not just any choices, but informed choices that matter. So picking the color of the railroad car you're riding on is a choice, but doesn't foster much sense of autonomy. No, what supports a sense of control is having choices where you have enough information to weigh outcomes, and the outcomes actually matter, like they affect the rest of the game. It's not just randomly picking a door with no idea what could happen, or choosing something that never comes up again. It's intentionally shaping the world of the experience. And that's what fosters a sense of control. And while Mass Effect and Bioware games are like an easy example, platformers are actually really good at this. You actually have a lot of choice in how you move through the level that impacts things later on. What power-ups you get, what resources you've used, how many lives you have left. Jumping as Mario, you know about where you're going to land, and it's literally a life or death choice, so it can be argued it's a meaningful choice every time you make it. Where was I? Okay, so autonomy. On to relatedness. This is really about feeling like your actions matter, and a good way for games to do that is making your actions matter to others. So this tends to focus on multiplayer games and sounds similar to autonomy. It's fostered by giving the player choices that matter to others. Both choices that impact other players and choices that are impacted by other players. Generally either that they're collaborating with, like teammates, or that they're competing with, like opponents. So the standard model for this is like the three-man blaster tank healer combo, where the blaster kills enemies, the tank blocks attacks, and the healer keeps them alive. Now each member of that group is gaining something by being there and providing something to the others, which is one of the reasons it's a good example and it's so widely used. 
It's also important competitively though. Like, if you look at League of Legends, they make a huge deal in their design things about counterplay. If you're in lane and one of you is getting steamrolled and can't do anything, that's boring. They build in incentives to interfere or react to what each other is doing to keep you engaged, and punish you for not reacting, to make it feel like your actions matter and you're not just waiting to do something or have something done to you. Okay, so that's an overview of the three elements of Penn's design and how they actually look in games. Next time we'll talk about how you bring these three together in game design and how they specifically apply to education. So for next time, consider how the games you play support these three needs or don't, and think about how the educational games you've played support them or don't.